Okay, welcome everyone to the Montana Museum of Art and Culture's uh, educational programming. And as always, we acknowledge that we are on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and, and Kalispell peoples. And uh, we acknowledge that, uh, that for centuries, for millennia, uh, these folks have taught us how to care for this place we call home. At the museum, we always add that art has always been a part of this place. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to have you joining us today uh, for Ashley Rickman's presentation. Uh, by way of a brief introduction, Ashley is currently the Montana Museum of Art and Culture's Interim Office Administrator, and she has actually been with us for a while uh, also as a curatorial intern. Most recently on the exhibition Homage to Africa, the Tony Hoyt and Molly Shepard Collections, this exhibition uh, runs until May 8th at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and we hope that you take advantage uh, and come and experience this magnificent art uh, live if you can. And if not, please uh, don't hesitate to check out our virtual docent tours, and those are available online. So just visit our webpage, and um, and you can uh, and you'll find the links to those um, to those tours. You can also uh, feel free to schedule a, uh, a live tour for groups under 10 people. We'll do that in a socially distanced fashion. And the person to talk to is actually Ashley Rickman. So, um, so actually you can put your requests in the, uh, in the chat box if you'd like, and we'll make sure that Ashley will reach out to you um, if you're interested in bringing a group to the museum between now and the closure on May 8th. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Ashley. Uh, who's going to be speaking about Cuba textile art and the significance of raffia cloth in Bakuba society. Ashley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raphael. And before we get started, I just want to say a very special thank you to Molly Shepard. She's been so gracious to share her collection with us, her collection of African art textiles and objects. And she's also been a huge source of um, research information for me as well. So thank you, Molly. I'm just going to take a quick moment here to share my screen. I've got a presentation here. Okay, does everyone see that all right? Great. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. As Raphael said, uh, my name is Ashley Rickman and today I'm gonna to be talking about Cuba textile art and the significance of raffia cloth in Bakuba society. One of the things that I love most about working with art is that the more I learn about an object, the more I fall in love with it. And this has never failed me. I was properly introduced to Bakuba textile, Bakuba textile art during my undergraduate studies at UM in a class taught by Dr. Rafael Chacon. Like many people around the world, I was drawn to the textiles inventive and abstracted designs. During my internship here at MIMAC, I have had the exciting opportunity to study the Bakuba raffia cloth textiles in more depth um, and study the textiles from Molly Shepard's collection in our current exhibition, Homage to Africa. Through my studies and experience with these textiles, I have fallen in love with them all the more and really gained appreciation and admiration for both Bakuba culture and their textile arts. Bakuba textile designs are, excuse me, Bakuba textiles are a medium for a visual symbolic language which communicates cultural ideas through artistic expression. Their raffia cloth textiles weave together this society through the cloth's utilitarian, economic, spiritual, and social functions. Each of these cultural elements relates back to the concept of a divine kingship and illustrates one's place within society. 
I did want to note that as a part of learning about this culture and their textile arts, I have explored a variety of sources, both secondary based on accounts of European, early European explorers, and primary sources from contemporary Western researchers, as well as the Bakuba peoples themselves. Looking at my research as a whole, I really sought to find a, a balance between these accounts. So first today, I will introduce the Bakuba culture of Central Africa, Bakuba of Central Africa and their culture, for whom textile art and raffia cloth in particular is a medium for a cultural and spiritual communication. Second, I will introduce the palm tree and its fibers from which the cloth is made. Then I will focus on the two different types of raffia cloth, the cut pile cloths, or velvets as many people know them, and the status skirts. And I will discuss the techniques used to turn the palm leaf into a masterful work of textile art. Next, I will describe the many functions of these two types of textiles, the many functions within Bakuba society. Then I will discuss their artistic designs on cloth and their visual and symbolic significance. And finally, I will discuss the Bakuba today and their continuing textile art traditions. The Bakuba are a confederation of 19 distinct groups in Central Africa held together by geographical, political, and social similarities. These groups migrated over time and coalesced in the central Zaire region of the Democratic Republic of Congo between the Kasai River and its tributaries, the Sankuru and Lulua rivers, which we'll see on the next slide here. The Bakuba kingdom is one of the oldest kingdoms in Africa, extending from the, great, the edge of the great equatorial forest to the edge of the savannah. The, oh, we'll just take a look at that slide real quick. You can see here, we're in Central Africa, right in the middle there, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Bakuba are a large and bureaucratically complex kingdom with a monarchy at the center of their class society. The ruling power is passed down through matrilineal inheritance within the core group called the Bouchon. And we can see here, it's, it's a bit difficult to see in the picture, but this blue area in the middle here is the Kuba kingdom with all of the 19 different distinct groups. Um, Kuba culture and Kuba textiles are sometimes referred to as Kasai, and that's the providence here. So this is in, in white is the, excuse me, the Kasai province. And these rivers, that, rivers and its tributaries I was speaking of is right here. So they're kind of in the wedge in there. And just take a quick note of the Congo kingdom, the earlier Congo kingdom, um, on the coast there, um, as we'll be um, just touching base on them as well. Europeans began probing into Central Africa after the first Portuguese rooted themselves on the equatorial coast in the 15th century. In response to, in response to this, the Bakuba enacted a policy of isolationism this halted the import of European goods, namely the textiles, European textiles that had been popular in the region for centuries. And this encouraged the Bakuba to focus on their own textile production and textile art traditions. As they gained power and consolidated resources in the region, their, art tradi their artistic traditions flourished. By the 18th and 19th centuries, the Bakuba held significant influence over a trade network which prized these raffia cloth textiles. Their wealth was built on the back of their art and their exquisite raffia cloth textiles were 
were central to both their economic development and their cultural identity. Rich traditions of mythology and ritual are expressed through Bakuba, through Bakuba art. Thus art is an important part of their cultural identity. When the Bakuba traditionally spoke of themselves, they did not use the names Bakuba, Kuba, or Kasai, which are names given to them by outsiders. They identified with either their individual ethnic groups or by names which evoke a defining cultural attribute, such as people of the king or people of the cloth, translated, of course. Vanessa Drake Mor Moraga, a writer, a writer and scholar specializing in textile arts of Africa and South America, says, of, says this of these culturally revealing names. These attributes are refracted through the culture's compelling and singular artistic vision. And she's speaking of people of the cloth and people of the king and those cultural attributes. The title People of the Cloth illustrates just how central textile arts are to the to Bakuba identity. As I watched an, an interview with a Bouchon Prince, a very contemporary current interview, I noticed that he did use the terms Bakuba and Kuba when speaking to the American audience. And for this purpose, for the purpose of our talk today, I will remain consistent and refer to this group as the Bakuba. The main form of textile art in which we will be exploring today is the raffia cloth. To understand the specifics of this cloth, we'll we will track the textile from its agricultural origins to a finished product. And we begin with the tree. Raffia cloth is a woven fabric made from the fibrous leaves of the squat raffia palm tree one of two palm trees that are abundant in the Congo and cultivated for the many goods that they produce. The palm tree is associated with royalty and considered an aristocrat among trees. Long filaments in the palm leaf called raffia fiber are used to produce the raffia cloth. For the many groups in Central Africa, raffia is a material that evokes spiritual and social connection. This fiber has been used for many practical purposes throughout history, from weaving baskets and nets to constructing houses and palaces. However, no raffia object is as central to Bakuba culture as the raffia cloth textile. There are two primary styles of raffia cloth. The first that I will address today is the cut pile cloth or velvet. Cut pile cloths are, a rect are rectangular in shape and approximately 26 inches long. Um, that length is dependent upon the length of the raffia fiber. One of the defining attributes uh, in excuse me, one of the defining attributes of a cut pile cloth is the three-dimensional brush texture, prompting the names plush, velvet, velour, and several other names um, that just describe that brush texture. Geometric motifs are created within the textured surface and decorated with embroidered partitions and outlines. The second of the embroidered cloth is the status cloth or skirt. And skirts are long bolts of fabric and they can reach up to 30 feet in length. These are worn on the body as far as um, for a few other purposes that we will see here shortly. 
and they are decorated with inventive and often, often playful designs. To produce both types of cloth, the long raffia fibers are stripped from the palm leaf, separated, dried, and worked until soft. Men weave the unspun fibers on a loom to produce the foundation cloth. These are usually undyed fibers, but sometimes they are dyed. And the weavings are sewn end to end to, until a desired length is achieved. And so in this case of the skirts, um, several are, are sewn together. In the case of the cup pile, it may just be the one. Women decorate the plain foundation cloth with embroidered geometric designs and motifs. And we will discuss those um, designs later on. When creating the skirt, embroiderers use both an applique technique and stem stitching to affix these figurative patches of dyed cloth onto the foundation weave. Raffia fiber can be quite fragile, so more geometric patches may be applied over time to mend the fabric when, when ripped or worn and to cover up imperfections, serving as both design and function. And one of my favorite things about looking at the cloths in Molly Shepard's collection at, um, at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture exhibition is to to try and figure out, was that original or was that added on later? And how does it um, change the design? You know, I think they're, they're so fun to just kind of um, look at and evaluate and soak up. In the case, In the case of the cut pile cloth, unknotted raffia fibers are woven tightly between the weft and the warp of the foundation cloth. Hundreds of these stitches amass to form a plush raised geometric motif. Stem stitching embroidery, excuse me, stem stitching embroidery is used to partition sections of the design and add intricate geometric details. Cut pile cloth production is a laborious and tedious process which takes one month to embroider one square meter textile and that's true for both the skirts and the cut pile. The embroidery takes a month to embroider one square meter textile and in the case of the cut pile it can take up to a year to produce a finished cloth. The weaving and embroidery techni techniques, excuse me, the weaving and embroidery techniques used, used to create these signature textiles came to the Bakuba from several African cultures over time. Raffia cloth was first introduced to the Bakuba by King Shyam in the 17th century. He learned of the weaving techniques from the Bapende and stem stitching embroidery from the Bikili both groups who would eventually integrate into the Bakuba. The embroidery technique is thought to be most likely originated um, from the early kingdom of the Congo, which we took a look at earlier, right on the, the coast there, along the Atlantic coast where it spread um, across Central Africa. It was the Showa tribe who introduced the practice of dense cut piled embroidery in the 17th century. The Nagongo, the Nagombi, excuse me, the Nagongo and the Nagombi are groups thought to have been practicing cut pile the longest and actually established much earlier than the groups of the Bushong and the Showa. And the Beying are thought to be the oldest of the, of the Bakuba embroiderers, though they do not practice this cut pile technique.
Now that we understand the process of creating raffia cloth and where the techniques came from, let's look at how the cloth is used within society. The functions of Bakuba raffia cloth are multi-layered because each of the elements of their culture is integrally intertwined. That is utilitarian, economic, spiritual, and social functions, and each relate back to the monarchy. Both cut pile cloths and raffia skirts were important for utilitarian purposes. Cut piles are used as rugs and to cover stools, like the rug underneath the platform in which the king sits during occasions of state. And the less elaborate cut pile cloths are used in the everyday home. Voluminous embroidered raffia skirts were worn by men for initiations masquerades, funerals, and ceremonies, while women wore wrappers of embroidered cloth for occasions. Undecorated cloth was the everyday wear, still common into the 20th century, and as you can see, um, lavishly embroidered cloth and often embroidered with, um, with other materials um, were for occasions. For their economic benefits, Bakuba used the prestigious cut pile cloth as local and foreign currency in an elaborate trade network that operated from the 17th to the 19th centuries. A surplus of cloth and other goods was moved along the kingdoms of the Atlantic coast. Plain raffia cloth was not part of this extensive trade network and it was made solely for local utilization. Though this network no longer exists, tourism now, plays, tourism now plays an economic role and some textiles are produced and sold for tourist consumption. In its spiritual function, raffia cloth can be seen as a fabric from which society itself is woven. It binds together the practices of initiations, masquerades, and funerary ceremonies together, excuse me, it binds together these practices by opening a channel between our world and the supernatural. Raffia is a guiding metaphor in Southern Nikon and Wandi male initiations, and it illustrates the cycles of life and death that initiates will metaphorically reenact in their journey to manhood. Initiates are first bound together by raffia necklaces in a symbolic social act, and then separated from civilization by walls made of raffia. While in exile in the forest, they will encounter representations of sacred spirits who are masked and also covered in raffia, raffia fibers. After their symbolic rebirth, the initiates will integrate back into society and celebrate their first dance as men dressed in the exquisite rut excuse me, dressed in the exquisite raffia skirt. Bakuba masquerades are a cultural practice in which spiritual and social statements are expressed through music, dance, and elaborate costuming. These traditions revolve around the concept of a divine kingship and a hierarchical political structure. Raffia skirts and plain fibers are part of the elaborate costuming and accoutrement which adorn the masked citizens as they take on the identity of natural and sacred spirits. During funerals in Bakuba Kingdom and throughout the Congo, the transition from life to death was mediated with the woven arts. It is used in quantity to wrap the dead and line the coffin, preparing the deceased for the afterlife. Embroidered cloth also conveys who a person was during their lifetime, emblematic of one's social status in this life. Raffia cloth is a powerful expression of social statements. 
In some cases, cloth is only one component, such as a hat or belt or special materials which adorn the fabric. It is clear that for the Bakuba, raffia cloth textiles serve as a vehicle to indicate power and prestige for all to see and to let others know of one's social rank within that political hierarchy. Another way to look at the functionality of Bakuba raffia cloth is that it indicates precisely who is the king, who the king is, both to those within the society and outside it. In the ancient Congo kingdom, whom experts look to for clues into Bakuba history and cultural practices, the woven arts were a tangible representation of the abstract concepts of privilege and power. The dress that is worn by the Bakuba king for important occasions is so elaborate it often weighs 150 pounds and is laden with special materials such as ivory, hippo tusk, special skins, metals, um, and other materials, cavalry shells, that account for the ensemble's weight both symbolically and physically. Now that we understand the functions of raffia cloth, let's take a closer look at the inventive designs for which the Bakuba are particularly known for. I will discuss the design's origins, formal elements, styles, and their symbolic significance in this African society. Bakuba textile designs were born of several influences, really taking shape over their long history as something unique to the Bakuba. There is evidence to support the relationship between these designs and that of late medieval liturgistic patterns and heraldic symbols. Europeans appropriated from African design and Africans were in turn influenced by European. Many design aspects are thought to have much older origins from Neolithic mark making on clothing to pre-alphabaic Iberian scripts and, Euro excuse me, and European Upper Paleolithic cave art. And as you can see over here, we have just one small example of a Neolithic ceramic design. Um, and the Bakuba over time have really shaped these influences to create a style all their own. Bakuba designs are akin to the flow of music and dance with rhythmic play of shape and line, accentuated form and unified pattern, all balanced within their spatial complexity. All of this is intriguing, but it is the formal, qual formal qualities of the design which elevate these textiles as exceptional works of art. Patterns are produced from the manipulation of three elements, that is line, color, and texture. Line is used to create shape and give the feeling of movement within a piece. Shapes are almost always geometric and rectilinear, favoring triangles, lozenge shapes or diamonds, and rectangles. The predominant color, the predominant colors used um, and this is throughout Central Africa, are white, what is called white, it's actually beige, but we, they, it's referred to as white. So we have white, brown, black, and red. Though these colors do have symbolic meaning, it is not, excuse me, it is not the range of, which, of colors which is most important, rather the proximity of contrasting light and dark hues. And I've used um, this textile here as an example of that from Molly Shepard's collection in homage to Africa. It's 
might be my fo most favorite textile in the collection. Texture variations are used to create visual depth and diversity within a piece. A strong sense of composition allows the embroiderers the freedom to play with these three elements and achieve inventive designs while maintaining overall unity. There are three trends in Bakuba design, one which is based in numbers, in which the Nagongo excelled, and whose style is more concerned with defining measured structures than with artistic expression. And you'll see as I go through these three um, Bakuba design trends, I cannot be certain that, that this is Nagongo, um, a Nagongo piece. Um, it is anonymous, however, I think it's a good representation of the, um, of those sort of measured numerical structures. The second design trend, The second design trend in which the Shua excels focuses on visual effects that trick the eye of the viewer. And this is one of my favorite pieces um, that I've seen from Molly Shepard's um, collection that, that reminds me of some really good eye, eye trickery. Distinct among Kuba textile designs are that of the Royal Bouchon which aim for perfect pattern symmetry and attend to a sober, excuse me, a sober, conservative, and hierarchical structure, which mimics the values of their political system. Now that I have detailed the formal qualities of these designs, I will discuss, excuse me, I will discuss their role in a greater cultural context. Bakuba design must not merely be reduced to its decorative function. According to Moraga, textile arts ultimately represent Bakuba's most versatile, dynamic, and imaginative form of visual expression, and the most important medium for an abstract visual language. Raffia cloth textiles communicate these cultural ideas and concepts through their embroidered designs. The visual language that Moraga refers to is the summation of a bottle of, excuse me, the visual language that Moraga refers to is the summation of a body of symbols and patterns. And each may be interpreted in multiple ways. Pattern names fall into three categories. The first are names which commemorate in a famous individual or the creator of the pattern. The second, pattern names which refer to a part of an object, such as the foot of a chicken. And the third and most abstract naming category are pattern names which refer to the activity of an object. For example, the use of interlocking hooks to symbolize the act of hugging your child. Some of Bakuba design, textile designs fall into, the, fall into a language of patterns called the script. The script is considered a women's language and follows paths, circuits, and systems to express cultural concepts and ideas. The script is used in both textile arts and female scarification practices. According to Georges Morant, a Dutch artist and scholar well-versed in Central African textile design, it can be said that design is a mode of thought which cannot be put into words. Each symbol and pattern in this complex, in this complex visual language helps to place a person which, within their cultural narrative. The raffia cloth textile is a medium for communicating these abstract concepts and cultural ideas.
Today, the Bakuba have, excuse me, today the Bakuba continue to cherish their artistic heritage and continue to produce and utilize raffia textiles for ceremonial and ritual purposes. And they still continue with masquerades, initiations, um, and funerary activities as well. Many of the crafts specialists still work exclusively for the king as they have done for generations. Today, each student at the School of Art at Musheng is required to create their own pattern. Cherishing design innovation and artistic tradition and the artistic tradition of raffia cloth as Bakuba have done for centuries. In conclusion, Bakuba textiles, textile arts have thrived for centuries and are still important today. Their raffia cloth textiles tie together this society through the cloth's utilitarian, economic, spiritual, and social functions. These functions identify one's place within society underneath the divine king. Bakuba culture is rooted in a symbolic visual language that is expressed through the artistry of embroidered cloth. Okay, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, we don't have any messages in the chat box. So I will um, actually, I'm going to end our recording here shortly and, uh, and then allow us to, uh, to move to questions from the audience. So bear with me a second here. And.